John joined Valmet in 1987 and has been involved in the pulp and paper industry for the last 30 years, principally in recovery boiler design and operation. He graduated from the University of Waterloo in Ontario and with a BA um, in mechanical engineering. He holds professional engineering license and has been a manufacturer's representative of the Blairback ESP subcommittee for over 15 years. Jeff graduated from Valdosta State University with a degree in biology and chemistry. He joined Valmet in 2012 as a product manager responsible for measurement and advanced control applications in the chemical recovery area. Prior to joining Valmet, Jeff spent 15 years working in the recovery and utility departments for several mills focusing primarily in the caustic plant and lime kiln areas. Now I will turn the webinar over to John and Jeff. John and Jeff, you may need to do star 7 to unmute your phone if you haven't done that already. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good afternoon and, and welcome and thank you for joining. Um, as most of you know, Blurback started more than 50 years ago, and it was started by a group of people that had an idea on how to reduce recovery boiler explosions. They got together and, and got a whole, mo whole lot more people involved and made a set of procedures and guidelines on how to implement these ideas uh, down, even down to the mill level. They started following these procedures even at times when things got very intense and as you know it can get quite intense in mill situations sometimes. It, and then they solicited feedback on those procedures uh, to make all their procedures and documentation a living document and they continue to do that today and by doing that they obtained exemplary results that everyone can be proud of as an industry on reducing the number of re recovery uh, boiler explosions to near zero every year. In dissolving tanks, there's a little bit of a different story. We also have the procedures and guidelines in Blurback to avoid dissolving tank explosions. AF&PA did a, another study in 2013 by Tom Grace where they studied the reason for explosions and why they were happening and guidelines were updated and, and changed, yet we haven't received the same downward trend in the number of dissolving tank explosions as, as witnessed by the two recent uh, recovery boiler explosions over the last number of years. And we're really, as, a, as an industry, not as happy with the results that we have uh, achieved there. And so what's the issue? What is the difference? I mean, is it the procedures? We, we do have the procedures. Is it we're not following the procedures in intense environment? Are we not getting as much feedback on dissolving tanks as we are on, in the other areas? Is it an equipment issue? Or is it just keeping out of the, those intense situations? And uh, we, that's what we're going to speak about today and, and try and raise the awareness of the issues around the dissolving tanks. We'll speak mostly about the equipment around it and how they interface with procedures and, and, and guidelines from Blurback. And then in, in the end, keeping out of those intense situations, we'll, Jeff Butler will take that part of it and, and talk about how to better control the, the dissolving tanks and things around it. The agenda for today, on, we'll talk about the incidents briefly that were, were brought up in the 2013 study. And then we'll talk about burners, size and construction, explosion relief, and agitation of the dissolving tanks, 
spouts and, spout and smell chattering, some safety features, spout plugs, spout cleaning, rotters, operating parameters, and then the dissolving tank uh, controls will by, uh, at the end. Uh, at Okay, let's talk about the incidents a little bit. And these are all of the incidents that really reported in the and, and studied in the in the 2013 report. That was um, that was done uh, based on 29 uh, different explosions that were reported to Blurback in detail, and there was enough information to disseminate and, and uh, get some learnings from them. In that report, indicated that 70% of the of the incidents occurred on boilers with sloped floors. And those sloped to the front, 60% of those 20 incidents that occurred were occurred on the um, boiler sloped to the front. If I can find. And for those of you who, I think most of you are aware, but slope, boilers slope to the front, have the uh, smelt spouts near the, near the front wall and in, uh, opposite the nose so that in most of these cases, the, in fact, in all of the cases really, the, the boiler was shut down but, uh, and, and starting up again on, on auxiliary fuel firing only when the incidents occurred and a lot of the, and some of the, of the impact of the uh, of, of starting the unit up, which caused the caused the explosion, was was the result of slag falling from the upper furnace area down into the lower furnace area. And as I, when you're sloping towards the front, as you can see, the, the slag would tend to end up in the front of the in the boiler, right in front of the smelt spouts, causing damming and plugging of the spouts, and then starting that up again caused. Uh, certainly played a role in the issue. When you're sloping to the rear, the slag would end up toward the rear of the boiler and you don't have the same number of issues as you would slope to the front. But as you can see, there was still 40% of those incidents that occurred when even with the sloping to the, uh, or with the uh, smelt spouts underneath the nose. Okay, in the, Another, the 14% of the units, and that's four out of the 29, were, were on boilers that were, uh, had what we call a partially sloping floor, uh, partially decanting floor, and that's where the smelt spout is elevated some inches above the, the floor to form a smelt pool. And it appears that that smelt pool may be helping mitigate the heavy runoffs that occur after a, after a, a startup or at, at a time when a lot of, uh, of smelt may be dammed up in, the, in, the, in your boiler and, and, uh, and then come out at one time when, when smelt spout, uh, spouts are opened. And that is one of the recommendations, at least from, from the AFMP report, that it, it at least consider increasing the height of the smelt spouts to, uh, to help improve the, the safety of, of the unit and make the startup of them easier. And it also help, can help with the uh, with the control of the, of the uh, in, uh, in the dissolving tank and, and in that it levels out the smelt flow to the to to the uh, dissolving tank and coming out of the boiler. And the, the finally, there was some incidents that about 17% of them were actually on decanting uh, floor furnaces and and uh, now all new boilers by every manufacturer virtually is made a decanting bottom and that's basically where you have the smelt spouts elevated higher and a, and a flat floor so that you keep a level of smelt across the whole width of the furnace. There were some incidents of these as well but they weren't as much, they were really, it weren't able to draw the same direct conclusions on, on what reasons, there was various reasons for them, some of them in the dissolving tank and some of them uh, actually at higher loads when, when operating on liquor and uh, plugging from gelling, jelly rolling and other issues that might have happened in the mill. Okay, let's talk a little bit about auxiliary fuel for, uh, burners as they, as you said, on those 
70% that happened on the slope floor units. Uh, auxiliary fuel firing was basically the only uh, form of firing at the time. There was really no black liquor involved at all, and it was really prolonged operation with significant heat input into the units, and some of them up to as much as 80% of the seaming rate was on, on the uh, coming out of the boiler at the time when the, when the the, the unit was still not firing black liquor, and they were trying to get the spouts opened, and in all cases there were spout openings and slag falls. So how do we handle auxiliary fuel for, uh, burners? We recommend that you, only about 25 to 30 percent of full load steaming of, uh, capacity is available in uh, start burners and the rest of the heat is put in up higher in the furnace if you need to produce steam that is put up by load burners up higher in the furnace. Also angle the, the burners down by 20 degrees so as you can see you can then direct the heat more, direct, uh, more directly down into the, into the area in front of the spouts and, and get the heat where it's needed and not in the and not uh, creating pools of, of uh, smelt behind dams where it, it can't be released from the boiler easily. Um, so as a recommendation, they also, if, when you're trying to clear out the, the uh, smelt bridges and dams in, in the furnace, it's a good idea to try and burn, start the burners closest to the smelt spout wall. That way your heat is, is concentrated in that area hopefully behind a, any dams or, or piles, and that way it can run off and you won't form the big pools that would cause, could cause issues in the, in the, in the furnace when you, when you open the, uh, when, when small spots are opened. Okay, from AF&P and uh, blur back recommendations, you have effective strategies, and there's the strategy thing again we talked about earlier from blur back, and guidelines on how much heat, heat to put in, and develop a consensus procedure. I mean, the consensus procedure being on ESP subcommittee, I know at times it is difficult to get a consensus, but when you do achieve a consensus, I think it's easier for everyone to follow it after that. So, Again, having those procedures and then following the procedures in intense situations and then getting feedback on the procedures and changing the procedures if they need to to, to get a, a procedure that you, everyone is comfortable with and, and uh, will, will, in the end will provide the results that we all know we can achieve and, and not getting uh, explosions in dissolving tanks any longer. So from a sizing standpoint, uh, the reports and, and blurback recommend, uh, indicate that it, you, the size of, the, or the, the, certainly the density and the mixing and the level in a dissolving tank can impact the degree of violence of an explosion, in, uh, especially when you get the heavy uh, runoffs, how do you, how, the speed at which you can add water or removing green liquor that can play a role in it, changes in density. And so really the size of the dissolving tank and how big a volume that is plays a role in, in, in how quickly you have to react and how quickly density changes occur in a tank. So from our standpoint, 25 minutes is kind of the minimum level. There are a number of units out there that are operating at that level or even slightly less than that. And, uh, but in reality, On new boilers, we um, on, on new boilers, the sizing is actually between 35 and 40, uh, 40 minutes for all, all sizes of boilers, and, and especially on small boilers, I think its consideration should be given to going to the higher higher uh, residence time in, in the tank itself. From a tank construction uh, standpoint, there's lots of different options available from stainless to carbon steel with concrete lining or even uh, duplex uh, tanks are, are, are being used nowadays to try and get lower maintenance and things. That's really a mill decision and, and uh, from a tank standard standpoint, uh, we, we just recommend that some standard be followed. There's really no direct tank uh, standard that applies directly to dissolving tanks, but if you at least follow some, 
some design standard, you're consistent and and uh, and you will get a tank that really is is will stand up in in uh, in, a, in adverse conditions. We use the API 620 and 650 design criteria with 100 inches of water. Uh, we've actually seen some tanks move a couple of feet in in uh, in some conditions and, and really survive through that, so we, we quite, we're quite confident that they are, they are sufficient design integrity. Okay, dissolving tank flooding is another aspect that, that, that was talked about and how do we, how do we prevent that? Because uh, if, if you get the tank level goes too high, you, act, you can actually impede the shattering and if your tank level goes above the interaction point between where your smelt and your, your shatter jet are interacting, you can be sure that you're not going to shatter that smelt very well. So how do we do that? Put a bell mouth opening on the tank. You slope it down steeply there at right after the opening. And you put a large downcomer down there. So to minimize any chance of plugging in that area. You put a, a, a clean out at the bottom, bottom seal at the bottom of the tank and you put a clean out at the top. Okay, and here's an indication of what can happen if a dissolving tank level goes too high or an over, uh, overflow uh, line is plugged. It can be, have very serious consequences. In here, again, it's just a visual of, of the, the tank itself and, and looking at where the, the steam and the smelt interact. That must be above where the level of the tank is when it's at its maximum overflow level. The other thing to look at is the freeboard above the liquid level. If you have an explosion da uh, damper that comes off the tank somewhere in the backside normally or on one side of the tank, there has to be enough freeboard for the any excursion to come out and, and relieve itself out through the tank, otherwise it's, it's basically going to come back up through your smelt spout area. Again, in, when, when looking at tank design, it's a good idea to use modern uh, methods and 3D modeling is available. There's a lot of action going on around the tank from the spouts to the all the lines feeding these the shatter jets and backup shatter jets and all of the other things going on. Also, you need the means of egress and you have a large explosion damper that might be leaving so that there's a lot of things going on and it's just a good idea to, to look at that beforehand and make sure that that is a, the, the best design it can be and using modern methods that, that can be done. As far as explosion relief itself, both Blurback uh, recommends that you, you have one and it not be at the uh, top of the tank and also re recommends that functional checks be done during operation on, on this, this tank. And how, how do we accomplish that? We put a large damper, basically one and a half percent of the floor, uh, floor area of the furnace. We put that away from the tank and it relieves out. Uh, it combined with a vent stack and uh, the velocity is kept to a minimum. You also put some knockout showers at the bottom of the tank to take the biggest particulates and, and things out of, out of the plume so that your, your, your uh, explosion vent remains uh, free uh, operational for the entire year. And you put some access platforms around it to, uh, to be able to, to, to check it during the year as well. Uh, and here's another, just another view of it. Again, you can relieve the, the vent either under a concrete roof or, or, or concrete floor away from a, where any personnel can um, access, or you can actually take it and take it outside the uh, boiler building and on off uh, outside to a, a point where it's, it's, uh, it, it can relieve without doing any damage to any personnel. Uh, the length of that, that duct work and actually putting it into the building can be a problem at times and you have to look at that as well when you're putting it together and, and uh, what impact that actually might have on the relieving ability of the, of the duct work if it's, if it's a long piece of duct work. 
Okay, some of the, uh, I think we talked about most of this uh, already. The weighted damper must reset, reset itself after an excursion and uh, all of the, the rest of the, the uh, Okay, let's, we can talk a little bit about agitation and backup agitation. Again, that agitation played a role in these incidents, poor agitation uh, more or less, and the degree of density and, and degree of, uh, really had an impact on the degree of violence of some of these explosions. Side-mounted agitators is our, our preferred. I'm not gonna go through all of the pluses and minuses on this at this point, um, other than to say, that on, on side mounted uh, agitators, you can actually feed uh, weak wash into the rear side of the impeller to reduce buildups and, and actually make it uh, improve its, uh, its uh, chances of, of uh, staying uh, operational uh, problem free. Top managed agitators, they also have some ups and downs on them. I'm, again, I'm not going to go through all of the details of them. Um, for what we use in, in agitators is obviously the size of the agitator gets bigger as the number of, as the um, size of the tank and the size of the boiler gets bigger and smaller boilers have two, two, uh, two agitators as a minimum and then you go three and higher and we try and keep about a 15 horsepower per thousand cubic me, uh, feet of operating level as, as far as the power in the agitators themselves. The uh, tanks are, are, for uh, let's say a 6.3 million pound boiler, that might mean uh, 72 horsepower versus of agitation in, in a dissolving tank. As a reference point. The other thing is that there is the ability to model uh, dissolving tanks now, and it's a good idea to to look at that and make sure that you you are getting adequate uh, agitation throughout your tank. I mean the Modeling has, has uh, really come a long way over, over the years and to take advantage of that and make sure we get the best agitation for, for a, at both location and the uh, and type of agitators. Um, as far as backup agitation, that's a recommendation from Blurback as well and, and from the FMPA. And one of the options is to put an, a third agitator in and, and a two agitator situation. You put a third agitator in to, in case one of them goes uh, bad. Probably the more, more common way of doing that is, is adding steam spargers in and around the tank. You try and uh, the blue lines here, you can see that you try and mimic the same uh, flow pattern of the agitator with the uh, with the shatter uh, with the steam spargers put in on on an angle and and actually angle down into the tank as well is is kind of okay. How long can you use backup agitation? Obviously, if you have an extra agitator in there and it, it does almost as good a job as the main agitator, then uh, you lose one. It, it, there should be no time limit with steam agit agitation, it's uh, really recommended to minimize the time of operation during that. You put a lot of excess heat into the uh, dissolving tank and that may impact your vent stack uh, capability to clean uh, the, the, the gas before it goes out into the environment. And we really don't have a lot of good feedback on the effectiveness of uh, using steam agitators for a long period of time. So if there's information out there, that might be a good idea to pass along as well. Okay, spouts and shattering. Next slide, please. Um, AFMPA also um, mentioned that the most, uh, smell shattering played a large role in the in the, uh, all of the incidents that occurred and, and lack of proper uh, shattering as well as possibly after a first excursion, the, the shattering j uh, jets moved or, uh, uh, or did, didn't shatter properly anymore because of maybe being displaced and that, uh, that uh, played a role in the excursions that thereafter. Uh, if you, what we try to use is an engineered nozzle 
a converging diverging nozzle that, that has the proper amount of force to be able to split the, the smelt stream properly and, and shatter it completely. And then as a backup, mounted on the same bracket in the, with the same trajectory but just a larger opening uh, to be used uh, when this, it, you get a very heavy runoffs and, the, and it overwhelms the, the primary shatter jet. And these, the recommendation for these backup shatter jets is to be operated from a remote locations so that you can turn them on when, when uh, things get a little bit too exciting down at the uh, deck level or at the spout level on the dissolving tank. Uh, again, have a, a, a good mounting bracket uh, to, uh, as well as a positive uh, locking mechanism on the handle to set the angle. That won't be easily displaced by either, either an excursion from the tank or when, uh, when operators around uh, the smelt spouts are rotting the, the uh, spouts. They won't move out of place. That's important. Um, in this case, they're mounted with the, with onto the, the spout themselves and go up and down with the boiler. So they, they as the uh, the boiler moves or, or uh, the, the the shattered jet will move with the smelt spouts and the entire boiler really. Okay, again, it's important to look at where you, you're actually shattering in the, in the tank itself. It must be above the liquid level we talked about earlier. But actually looking, starting from the beginning on the opening size, the, the newer openings with the uh, insertable spouts, they tend to be a little bit bigger, which would make it easier to, uh, to, to open a, a spout in, in a case it's, it, it had uh, plugged off. And also the spout angle is, is important. The steep drop off the, is used to keep the, this, a positive flow of smelt going down into the, into the dissolving tank. And it also makes it easier if, there, if you get into cases where there's jelly rolling and things that the smelt will roll down the uh, steeper slope a little bit easier. Uh, dual shatter jets, again, is a backup and it must intersect. And so when you set one up, you're setting both of them up. You can be sure of that. Um, the other thing to, to look at, and I think it's a good idea to, to, to make a drawing of your actual water itself and, and, your, and your dissolving tank, is to look at the trajectory of the, of the jet uh, and, and just visualize it when, it when it's in a high flow situation and really flowing heavily out of that. It still has to be underneath where the shatter jet is. If it actually comes over top of the jet or in, envelops the jet, it, there's not much chance of that jet then, uh, then shattering the smelt anymore. Also on the other end of it, when you look at when you're getting jelly rolling and it's dropping off, you don't want that smelt to be uh, unshattered before it hits the liquid level in the, in the dissolving tank. Uh, the other thing you need to look at at that time too is, is where the shatter jet is going to uh, displace the, the shattered uh, smelt because if it's on the back wall of the tank, there's chances are you'll be causing some, some issues with the dissolving tank itself. Okay. I think this is all covered already in, in, in what I had talked about as far as backups. Uh, again, this slide covers it in, in a different manner. Some of the additional features is to have uh, enough showers and, and uh, hood showers to keep the area underneath the smelt spout uh, itself clear so that you're not getting buildups there that may redirect your, your smelt outside the dissolving tank. Steam is really the only uh, shattering medium that we have used. We really don't have any, any uh, experience with others. And uh, shattered jet pressures, 150 PSI. Again, looking at that, we can, um, we can see a good, a properly shattered uh, smelt stream. It basically explodes and, and, and into a million pieces. Whereas sometimes if you can get over pressure, you'll see smelt dro dropping off of each side of the, of the uh, uh, unshattered uh, smelt going on either side of, of the uh, uh, smelt spout uh, it's, uh, or the shattered jet uh, trajectory, steam trajectory. Underneath the tank, again, keeping everything clear there with as, as few obstacles as possible where buildups might occur on the uh, 
washing, wash, keeping that washed off and, that, and uh, clear, then no buildups can occur, then the smelt doesn't get displaced as it gets down into the tank. That's important to, uh, to the safety of the operators around uh, working above the tank as well as to keep a, a smooth flow of, of smelt into the dissolving tank. Uh, some uh, additional safety features, you, doors in front of the uh, smelt spouts has, has also helped to, to keep the uh, operators safe when they're doing duties outside of uh, directly uh, related to the, the smelt spouts around the primary airports and things. You can put doors in front to, to keep that area safe and, and more uh, operator friendly. Smelt plugs. I think in, in cases where you get into some issues with, with uh, either, either your, your smelt spouts or, or uh, other things, um, shattered jets or something around the spouts, and you need to plug them off. I think there's been lots of different methods tried, uh, from anything from, from gloves to, uh, to uh, I don't know, uh, but... Uh, what we prefer to see is an engineered plug being used for that duty where it fits in the, in the exact opening size of the spout itself and can be put in there very quickly and then locked into place so that when you have to do some work around the shower bars or something on the spout that you, the operator can be sure that there's no, no smelt going to be coming out of the or leaking out or you're breaking, breaking whatever mech that you had to plug off that spout. Okay, again, lock, having, having a good, uh, safe locking mechanism is very important on, on that uh, aspect of the unit. As far as cleaning and rotters, there's many things that have been used, and certainly uh, opening spouts was a, was a big contributing factor to, to uh, a lot of the incidents here. Uh, the traditional method of cleaning spouts is basically a rod and, and a strong back from an operator and uh, they do that on their regular rounds. Um, some spout rotters have been, have been mechanical type, have been come up with and I'm not going to say anything more on those. Uh, we prefer to go into the age of the robotics and use a actually robot that can, can actually see and, and look into each spout and and clean the spout itself, open the doors by itself, and be able to clean the, both the spout and, and the area underneath the spout in the, in the uh, doghouse and areas below the, uh, the, 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 uh, below the spout going into the dissolving tank. Okay, some of the pros and cons of that, uh, of an automatic router, but, Rotter basically reduces the risk and, and, and the frequency and the number of times that the operators need to go out in front of the smelt spouts in an, in an area uh, there. The uh, spout routers also always wear all of their protective equipment so there's no to, uh, to keep them fit safe and the spout rotter will actually move back into an area of, uh, out of the way of the smelt spouts in order for maintenance to be done on, that, on the unit itself. Okay, we can talk briefly about some operating parameters. Um, normal operating temperature on the uh, dissolving tank, 194 to 207 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go too low, you risk personite buildups. If you go too high, you're going to get lots of vent gases coming off the tank and, and possibly boiling the tank. Uh, I just want to mention the University of Toronto is now actually studying a lot of... Uh, uh, how smelt interacts with steam and, and they shattered and, and how it interacts when it hits the li liquid level of the, the tank itself and also um, some, some things on the acoustics in the tank and can the acoustics be actually maybe used to, to look at what's happening within the tank. And uh, that's a good uh, program and I think it's good to support them in, in their efforts as well as an industry as well. Okay. Um, I think the, ne the next part of the, of the uh, presentation will be done by Jeff Butler in, in talking about the, 
the dissolving tank controls and, and really how to, how to keep out of situations where, the, uh, where you're getting into extremely heavy runoffs and, and, uh, and that really comes from the overall normal, normal operation of the, of, the, uh, of the boiler and the, and the uh, dissolving tanks. Thank you. Jeff? Okay. All right. Can uh, everybody hear me, I hope? So um, the part of the, the, the AFMPA report that I'm kind of trying to address is conditions in the dissolving tank with regard to uh, the, the, the density and density control. Um, so um, most of the mills uh, are, are, are controlling for density. Uh, that's the recommendations from, uh, from the OEM. Uh, and, and we don't we don't certainly uh, disagree with that at all. We think that's the right thing to do from a control perspective. Uh, the, the problem with density or dissolving tank control um, is 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 it's a twofold issue. The first is the uh, measurements, uh, and then the second is uh, level uh, versus density. Uh, th those are the two things that uh, make it very, very difficult. Uh, it's, it's very hard to maintain uh, a density measurement. Uh, the difficult chemistry and environment for the instrument makes it very, very difficult uh, to confirm accuracy and maintain the, the unit. Um, most mills will, will end up in the long run looking at density, um, the density indication, whatever that online measurement is. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of times the, the field measurements, uh, whether it be a titration bomb A test or whatever, uh, for making density target adjustments. Uh, I know this next bullet point is somewhat controversial in, in some circles. Uh, there's a lot of people that will vehemently disagree with us uh, on this point. But DTA and density are correlated. There is a relationship that you can build between the two. You can model and build between the two. And to be clear, when I'm talking about um, TTA, I'm, I'm talking about the entire analytic. If I understand the concentration of the sodium hydroxide, the sodium sulfide, the sodium carbonate, and the sodium sulfate in that green liquor, um, it, it's not terribly difficult to predict a de uh, density uh, based on that analytical measurement. I know the concentration. I know the molar mass. Um, it, it's not a stretch um, to develop that correlation. So when I say TTA and density are correlated, understand, yes, I'm talking about the TTA measurement, but it's the entire analytic uh, that is considered in the control. Um, we believe that having a combination of the online density indication um, and then high-frequency titrations uh, can provide a, a fairly significant benefit in stabilizing both TTA and density. At the end of the day, when we're doing an optimization project, what the goal is is to stabilize the TTA for the downstream user, i.e., the recost plant. Um, but uh, getting a density control benefit uh, is is critical as well. Um, as far as the measurements go, um, all of the known measurement platforms have their own issues. Uh, with the raw green liquor chemistry, uh, scaling measurement drifts are common problems. Uh, there's some degree of preventative maintenance that's required for all of them uh, to be successful. And, and there are successful installations for just about every device out there. Um, I put successful in quotes because um, it, there's a difference between something that provides a, a pretty good measurement and a measurement that is control suitable. Um, so our definition of successful is a little bit different. I won't spend a lot of time uh, on the individual measurement platforms, and I'm sure I haven't captured them all, uh, but this is based on our audits uh, in the installed base where we have control applications. Um, so bubble tubes, um, again, the, we see these a lot. Uh, they do require maintenance. Uh, differential pressure cells, uh, one of the things that we see there a lot, flush rings, isolation valves are critical. You're going to have to work with this um, uh, with a DP cell, uh, if, especially at the bottom of the dissolving tank. Uh, so you have to be able to, to, to access it and keep it clean uh, to keep it reliable or to give it a chance to be reliable. 
I have seen some very successful installations that do control uh, that, that that do provide a a very good control measurement, um, and, and that's a a system where there's a small stand uh, small stand pipe with a DP cell at the bottom uh, measuring the flows in and out. Um, and, and some of the best manual control of a dissolving tank has been with this uh, with this setup. Uh, again, it still requires maintenance. You're going to have to work on that DP cell at some time. Uh, nuclear, probably the most common uh, that we st still see in the industry. Uh, they're fairly reliable, uh, but prone to drift um, as scale forms in the piping. Regular maintenance, obviously. Uh, and one of the things that we see quite a bit is, is the proper calibration. Uh, what we see a lot of times is dialing in of the instrument uh, based on a lab test. The operator will call an E&I technician and say, hey, listen, I can get in this, the density meter is saying that, and they go make it match. Uh, if that transmitter doesn't have a slope, like all transmitters, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to be accurate as the process changes. Um, so when, if you're going to calibrate your nuclear meter, you want to make sure that you take the time and, and do it uh, per the manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, refractometers, uh, based on what I've seen, what we've seen in, in uh, the installed base, refractometers seem to be uh, fairly unreliable. Um, the, the, the liquor chemistry and the prism uh, don't mix, uh, so getting that wash set up is very critical. Uh, I have seen them work uh, for, for very short intervals. Uh, but ultimately, the measurement drift requires the, the refractometer to be removed, uh, cleaned, and, and put back in. Um, you know, I know that there's been some advancements in the refracts. Um, you know, the ones I've seen um, have the new versions. I, I haven't seen work much better. Uh, again, I know there's, there's some mills that, that swear by the refractometers. I'm not saying that they don't work, uh, but this is in reference to a control-suitable measurement. Um, so what we've seen is the refractometers have been uh, very difficult to use in, in control applications. Uh, Coriolis meters uh, have started to see a few more of these. Uh, measurement obviously is based on vibration, so green liquor scale is an issue uh, for that instrument. Uh, historically, it's been a problem uh, keeping those things clean and keeping them accurate. Uh, I have seen a few mills now, I, I say one here, but I've seen two now, uh, where it's measuring a slipstream off the dissolving tank transfer pumps. Um, there is a continuous uh, anti-scale uh, addition to keep that device clean, and, and at least the preliminary results that I've done in those data studies have been fairly promising. Uh, so the, the point of that is there's a lot of different ways to measure it, uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's a difficult measurement to keep working uh, and to keep reliable. So with regard to density and TTA control, uh, you know, with high frequency measurements, uh, you know, the, the problem is that a dissolving tank is designed in the best case scenario, 25, 30 minutes of retention time. Most mills that we audit uh, have less than that. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're running hard and the retention time's just not there. If you're doing manual tests every couple of hours, it's very difficult to see uh, all the turnovers in that dissolving tank. Uh, so what we try to do is measure uh, the analytic out of the dissolving tank every eight to 10 minutes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, level control and density fight each other. Level control has priority. There's reasons that you want to maintain an operating level in the dissolving tank. Uh, that is the more priority um, uh, control feature. Uh, but density suffers uh, as a function of maintaining that uh, level at a given number. Uh, so as you pump out hard, as the, as the, uh, the VFD is out or the valve is out uh, on the upper end, uh, you're pumping out hard, your density changes compared to when it's cut back trying to maintain level. So density swings. Our goal with the high frequency measurements is to capture uh, the analytic, to understand what's going on in the chemistry, compare that to what the density meter is telling us, model that, and then um, you know, use that difference for control. So online uh, density indication is important, uh, as well as high frequency measurements. Uh, we have found that to be a very successful control strategy. 
uh, for both TTA and for density. And this is just an example of a mill where our controls are, are in service. Um, and you can see where we turn the controls on. This is actually the mill's online density indication. So while the goal is to, to stabilize TTA, um, there is some benefit, obviously, to, to the density, the actual density coming out of the dissolving tank. So with that, I believe that is my last slide. We do have several uh, questions. So, um, I, John and Jeff, do you want to go through the questions now? Um, yeah, I guess I can go through this, this first one. Uh, it is, is, is there a way to determine if a dissolving tank explosion is about to occur? And I really got this from a uh, there was certainly uh, in one of the in one of the more recent reports, one of the operators said uh, indicated that they had a lot of lot of violent reaction going around the tank, and it was very noisy and lots of, and it was uh, you know you couldn't you couldn't go near there. But then all of a sudden everything went quiet, and then right af shortly after that, uh, that's when the uh, the tank let go or the uh, the uh, incident occurred, so I guess that's a little bit of a late warning, but if all things go quiet when, when you know it, it, there's a lot of uh, smelt going into the tank, uh, rushing into the tank, then it's, then it's really time to, to get out of the area in, uh, in and around the dissolving tank as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, okay. Um, Jeff, do you want to take a question? or? I think most of these are um, more along you know the the material that you were covering. I don't really see okay. much with regard to control yet in the queue. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll take the next on. Uh, how does the automatic port router help prevent an explosion? Basically, by keeping really the operating conditions in in the dissolving tank and around the whole mill as as uniform as possible, then you avoid the conditions where upsets. And not only in and around the recovery boiler, but in and around the whole mill, so that it, it, it if you the more smoothly you can run your whole mill, the less chance you have of getting into situations where you're getting heavy fouling or your sulfidity gets out of control or or any uh, or many of the other things that would contribute to the uh, to the uh, uh, dissolving tank uh, excursion. The other thing is if if you are getting into an, a situation, especially in jelly rolling, where you're Firing liquor and and you can be down there every uh, you know more often and and uh, consistently cleaning out the the ports to make sure that they are free to uh, to get the smelt out of the boiler. Then there's less chance of that building up in uh, when an operator is is maybe on other duties uh, away from the, the dissolving tank. Uh, there's a question about gases coming out of an explosion relief. Is there a concern of hazardous gases, uh, H2S and SO2, uh, and, and would require monitors and around the, uh, the relief area? And I, I would say yes, that certainly the same gases that come out of the vent stack is what you're going to see coming out when you have a, an explosion or, or excursion. So certainly on a short-term basis, it probably is a very good idea to put an H2S or SO2 monitors in that area to, to see if you're, if you're, uh, if it could help if, if, if it's leaking or, or if you have excursions to warn operators to, or personnel to stay out of that area. Uh, causes of jelly rolling, maybe Jeff, I don't know, you can talk about that as much, uh, Better than I can in a lot. Yeah, what typically what we typically what we see there is um, uh, a lot of times it's it's related to sulfidity control. Uh, when your sulfidity gets out of control in the mill, it, and this can be actually on both ends. It can be both on on you know the, the high end of sulfidity and the low end of sulfidity, uh, where 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 we've seen the jelly rolling occur. Um, you know, I, I it. it when your sulfidity gets out of whack, you're changing the melting point of the smelt. Um, so, so that's when you see that jelly rolling. Um, 
the, the best way to deal with it, and I, it, this is an easier said than done uh, response, um, but I think if, if getting good handle on your sulfidity uh, control, um, you know, depending on what kind of mill, if you're a bleach plant mill, uh, if you're a brown mill, uh, what you do with sulfur makeup, how you make up sulfur, where you put the sulfur in your system, uh, those are all things to consider uh, for sulfidity control. So I, I know that's a bit of a, um, you know, a broad answer for the best way to deal with it. Uh, but to me, the best way to deal with jelly rolling is to stay out of the conditions that create it. Uh, and, and typically that is uh, a lot of times, um, um, you know, maintaining and controlling your sulfidity uh, at a reasonable level. I don't know if you want to add any more to that, John. No, I, I, I think that's... Um, okay, there's a question here. C can you specify a bit more about poor agitation will increase explosion risks? And uh, that certainly was, was identified in the, uh, in the AFMPA report and, and that certainly the density, if you get density buildup and high density in certain areas of the... Uh, of the tank that that may impact how the, how uh, violent the uh, the excursion is. Uh, what I can say is if if you have buildups in your tank that really, especially a tank that might have a very short residence time in the, in the, you know in the twenties uh, as far as uh, uh, residence time and and you have big buildup areas in there that's not getting any agitation and then basically you reduce the re residence time even more by by having big big buildups in your tank and and uh, then you put yourself even at that less time of of uh, residence and and it's harder to control or or to uh, increase your uh, your keep your sulfidity level or keep your density levels down in, in a time when you're getting very heavy runoffs or, or uh, a big increase in the smelt coming into the dissolving tank. Uh, there's a question here on refractory material. I think we're going to have to answer that offline. I don't really know specifically what refractory material is used in the tank, and I, I can get back to you on that as far as uh, what our re uh, recommendation might be. Um, there's an answer on, on the angle of spelt, smelt spouts. What is the current range and what is your recommendation? Our rec, uh, we use the 35 degree uh, angle on the smelt spouts. That's our uh, one angle that we use and, and we basically on all our spouts are the same. Uh, do you know some way to know the level, level uh, tank locally. This is important if we, uh, if we have uh, a, uh, if there is a failure of the transmitter and I have seen there, we use actually a, a uh, what is it, a float, float ball uh, type of device, floating device on, on the tank where you can actually, I know in one, in one particular uh, mill they put a hard hat on top of this floating uh, device that basically showed where, where the tank w level was uh, visually from locally from around the, just above the dissolving tank so that those can be put on the, on the tank. Okay, what is meant by minor explosions? I would say a minor explosion is is anything that just lifts the uh, uh, lifts your your uh, explosion relief vent, or and maybe opens opens doors on hoods and things like that, but nothing that would do it ha has any damage done onto the uh, equipment itself. Okay, this next question, uh, Jeff, is for you. Yeah, that, that is, uh, can be a bit lengthy uh, to, to discuss here. Um, just, just in brief, uh, what we do is we build a model between the online density indication, whatever that is, uh, and, and with the analytics coming from the analyzer. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is correlate when your density says this, uh, the, the TTA, uh, the, the chemistry in the dissolving tank is that. 
so we we co we convert that to a what we call a predicted density model the two uh, your online plus our predicted and then we respond to the differential between the two uh, and we calculate a bias set point that goes out to the weak wash controller uh, to make sure that um, you know we're stable uh, that helps us compensate a bit for measurement drift um, but um, you know again it's, it's it's much more detailed than that probably more detailed than we can get into here um, if you'd like, send me an email, uh, and I can go deeper with you. So the next question here, uh, have you tried uh, feed forward control using the spout, uh, spout uh, water outlet temperature? Uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at how to use temperatures uh, in our controls uh, to give us more of a safety feature. Uh, as well as um, you know, improving the control if we can. Uh, again, we've looked at this kind of at a high level. Uh, however, um, you know, we're not at a point where we're actually incorporating that specific temperature. We are looking at dissolving tank temperature if it's available. Uh, we've also seen some correlations between the dissolving tank um, uh, scrubber stack. Uh, temperature, if there's one there, uh, to incorporate those into the controls to improve the uh, the safety aspect um, of of control. Okay. Next question is on slide 21. If we have any more explanation of that, and I would, the short answer is no. Uh, other than to. I think uh, other other than to say it, it, it I believe there was the the uh, uh, overflow was plugged at the at the time and was that the sole, only reason for the incident or not I'm not sure uh, but the tank level went too high from what my understanding of it and and uh, and the smelt wasn't getting adequ adequately shattered before it went into the tank and uh, the tank uh, basically was. Uh, or the uh, incident occurred, there was a, a violent reaction and the tank was moved and, uh, and there was a lot of damage done at, at, in and around the, the spouts as, uh, as well as, you know, ripping them right off the, off the boiler itself and then and in and around the tank. Uh, so uh, it was quite a, quite an, a, a severe uh, reaction. Okay. I guess that's your next one, Jeff, is it? Yeah, with regard to controlling the dissolving tank temperature, um, yeah, I, 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 I know of a number of mills that, um, you know, when they start up, uh, you know, they'll backfill uh, the dissolving tank with green liquor uh, from the clarifier. Um, depending on how long you've been down, um, you know, usually that's from an annual outage. Uh, there seems to be some benefit there. Um, I, I don't know that I could speak to it on, on any uh, scientific or studied level, uh, but I do see a lot of mills doing uh, something with controlling dissolving tank temperature on startup, particularly from a cold outage. Um, you know, it used to be back when I was in the mills, you'd see a lot of weak wash backfill, and then you just start up and, and go. Uh, but but I'm starting to see more and more mills when I audit them back filming with green liquor from the dissolving tank and if they have the ability to heat it, um, you know, a lot of mills are doing that. Um, seems to be benefit, um, uh, but I, like I said, I can't speak to it from a scientific perspective. I don't know if John has any any thoughts on that. No, I know there's been a lot of the discussions on that and and how loud a tank is when it's uh, when it's extremely cold in in a in a startup and I I I don't really know if that played a role in any of the uh, uh, excursions or explosions or not uh, and I think some of that work uh, that uh, they're doing at the University of Toronto is is going to try and hopefully get a better understanding of the mechanism uh, where the uh, where the smelt actually shatters when it gets into the liquid and hopefully give us a better understanding. We'll be able to give a better answer on, uh, or they will be able to give a better answer on 
on what is the best temperature or which, which areas maybe you should be avoiding when you're uh, on startup as well as operation. Yeah. Um, uh, with I guess I can take the next one there, John. Is it too slow or too late to use TTA or density change information to prevent dissolving tank explosions? Um, you know, that, that's, that's a hard question to answer uh, from a control perspective. Obviously, controls are, are, are designed to try to keep you out of those conditions. Uh, however, uh, you know, when you get a massive uh, runoff, uh, unplugging a spout or something of that nature, uh, most of your regulatory control loops uh, are, are going to be tuned too slow to respond to that. Uh, so what I've seen some mills do is they have um, a density setting uh, built into the DCS where um, you know a flood valve, a mill water valve, a fire water valve, whatever the case may be, uh, will come on automatically if you trigger that density threshold. Um, I, I would think that that would help, uh, but the reality is the dissolving tanks are small. Um, you know, typically maintained at 50, 60 percent operating level. Um, you know, so so changes in density can happen very, very quickly. Unfortunately, uh, so John, I don't know if you have any design uh, criteria uh, that might address that question as well. But from a control perspective, um, it's a little tough to do. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we talked a little bit about the residence time. So if you can get your residence time up uh, a little bit, that's obviously going to give you, you know, to 30, 35 minutes or 40 minutes, that's going to give you a little bit better chance to react. Uh, I agree with Jeff. It, it's, uh, but, you know, the, the reality is that it's not only density in the tank. It's, it's a lot of other things that played a role in, in that uh, in that uh, those excursions, and if you if you can keep the rest of it, if you can keep your shatter uh, jets and and even at the high flows, if you can keep it shattering properly, and your your controls can react to that 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 pro and if the density goes real high, um, you know is that you've got a better chance of staying out out of it if your if your controls can react to the density, I guess. Uh, um, the yeah. Again, yeah. So what is the maximum dissolving tank TTA in grams per liter NA2O uh, that is allowed to operate in order uh, to avoid a dissolving tank explosion? Uh, the short answer there is um, I, I don't know that anybody knows for sure what the, what the maximum is. Um, it, it's different uh, based on different processed liquors. Um, you know, Certainly, if you're getting into um, you know Pearsonite scale uh, areas, uh, your density is too high. Uh, that that's a that's the easy answer. Um, you know we we have mills uh, that are operating um, in the uh, 125 to to 128 uh, grams per liter under control. Um, that, that are not experiencing Pearsonite scale issues. Um, to, to say you can't go above X, uh, I think is a little, um, a little hard to say. Uh, don't know if you have any thoughts on that, John. Uh, you know, but typically when you get above, I, I'd say once you start getting up, and, and some of this is sulfidity dependent too, um, you know, if you're running a low sulfidity, uh, you, you may not want to get in that, um, you know, that 127, 128 range. Um, you know, so, so there's a lot of factors to consider. If you'd like to send me some of your specific operating information uh, directly, I, I could answer, uh, you know, what might be a safe level for you there. Yeah, the only... Uh the only thing I can say on that is there was some comment on the density impacting the the explosions and the uh, but I don't know that there's any really hard uh, knowledge on that and that's something that again you maybe talk to uh, the uh, well yeah talk talk to I, I mean uh, the the author of the of the report is possible or some other people I, I don't know of any direct correlation that says uh, it, 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 
this, it, it, there's a, a, a level where you're, you're, you're in much more danger of, of having an explosion if you go above a certain density level. I don't know that, that there's any evidence out there that, or any, any knowledge out there that would say that, that, there, that there is a certain point that is, uh, is critical. Okay. Are dissolving tanks designed with a secondary overflow as a precaution in case of uh, primary overflow is plugged? Uh, at least we do not do that. I don't know if there's some, I mean, that's certainly a possibility to look at if, uh, if that, uh, I think if you, if you have a properly designed uh, primary overflow with the, uh, where, where you can visually check uh, the water seal and, and actually check it uh, from the top down, then uh, a secondary is, is probably not necessary, but certainly something that can be discussed and, and added if necessary, or if that's the... If a consensus is reached that it's needed, okay. I think that was it for the questions, unless there's something we missed. Oh, one last. Is, <laughs> what is ideal sulfidity? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's a. I guess that's another tough one to answer specifically. Uh, a lot of that is uh, depending on what you're making. Um, you know, I can see some of the the, the higher yield liner board mills where, uh, you know, they'll run a fairly low sulfidity, uh, something down in, the, you know, 18, 20 percent sometimes. Um, uh, some of the other mills, uh, you know, I, I, ideal. Uh, it means different things to different people. Um, again, if you want to send me some some information uh, on your mill specifically, uh, I would be glad to to take a look at it and and see um, what what might be ideal, uh, at least based to your uh, based on your peers, uh, other people in the the market that you're in. Uh, I think it's hard to say that this isn't the ideal sulfidity for all mills, uh, so it is somewhat mill specific. I wish I could give you a better answer than that. I think that's uh, the last question. So um, thank you, John and Jeff, for an excellent presentation. And we thank you all for uh, joining us today. This concludes today's webinar.